Okay, so uh, please, I'm going to sit down, okay, for today's lecture more because I will be uh, using my computer to move from one uh, part of the lecture to another. Uh, let me first of all tell you, this is uh, the main book I'm using for today's lecture is this one, this is the book, okay, it's called Linguistics. An introduction to language and communication is sixth edition by uh, by these authors. Okay, so this is the main reference. Just to give credit, okay, to these guys. Now let me move on to that chart you were looking at at the beginning. So, which shows the anatomy. You remember the anatomy we have spoken about in the very first classes? Yes. So, page seventy. So, the features which I'm going to recapitulate today and focus on today with uh, more examples. So, of course, as you understand, the features we have spoken about, they, they are all coming from a description of our anatomy. What we use, okay, in the production of sounds, okay? So, this is the recap of the anatomy. So, we have the vocal tracts, the larynx, the trachea, you can have, you see, everything is in front of you, as you can see, so this is the right lung, of course, and then the external intercostal muscles, diagram. so all these are important for, okay, production of sounds, okay, including, including the lens, basically, which we use for uh, pushing the air out for our cases, and some other people use the air and push it in for producing sounds, right? For more detailed description of the anatomy, I'm going to go to another, before I go to the other one, the, uh, another component of the anatomy, which is very important, is the larynx, and in the larynx we have this. We have this, which is the astronoid cartilages, and then the glottis, and then the vocal cords. Because as you know, one of the main features of sounds are voiced or not voiced. Okay? A number of them are distinguished, are different from one to another because of this feature. Okay? So this is another part of our vocal tract that is very crucial for production of sounds and of course for descri describing the features of the sounds. Right? Then the other detailed, this is one is detailed, okay? You have all the organs of speech okay, uh, in the vocal tract, with a focus on the vocal tract, we focus here just on the vocal tract, there is no description or reference to the lands, etc., right? So the vocal tract, so these are the main parts of speech, we call them, uh, we use for producing sounds. So we have the, let's go by number, so we have the nasal cavity, again, this is a description, this is the nasal cavity, this is the heart palate, Okay, the alveolar ridge. Okay, you see this is the teeth, and then just behind the teeth we have this alveolar ridge, the labial region, the lips. Okay, the tongue, the vocal cords again. Okay, with, uh, which exists in the glottal region, the trachea, tube to lens. This is a tube, the trachea. It is the tube which we use for pushing the air out. And then you have eight here, the villum. This is the villum, soft palate in other words, another term for this part of, this, uh, of, of our vocal tract is the soft palate. Tongue blade, okay, tongue blade. Tongue tip, this is the tongue tip, the very top of your tongue. The uvula, which we use a lot in our Arabic for producing some sounds like etc. The pharynx, the epiglottis, and then the esophagus, tube to stomach, okay, this is uh, okay, something else, okay? But this is, these are the main organs we use for producing sounds. Now, relying on this, okay, in addition to the place of articulation used in the terminology, the technical terminology used in the field. So these are the places of articulation. 
the places we use for articulating sounds. So we have places of articulation. Then the other part is the manners of articulation. The way we use the lips. So we have the lips, we use the lips, yes, right? But we can use the lips differently. We have the organs, oh, sorry, uh, the, uh, what are they called? Uh, the vocal cords. The, the vocal cords, all of us, but we use the vocal cords differently. Sometimes we vibrate them, sometimes we don't vibrate them. So the manner of articulation is also important in uh, describing sounds. So we can describe sounds in terms of features that are coming from place of articulation. We can also describe sounds in terms of, of manner of articulation. Okay? So, and that's why you had this. You remember this? Very, uh, okay? This, uh, uh, you have it, and you can have it from internet, okay, easily. You can just Google the word, okay, the consonants of English chart, and you can have this. So here you have the place of articulation, and here you have the manner of articulation. Here you have the sounds of English, okay, the consonants here, basically. We have just the consonants. We're going to have a look at another chart where we have the vowels. So the consonants, using the features related to place of articulation, and using the features related to manner of articulation, we can describe these consonants. For example, if we take P, P, and B. So P is bilabial because we use the lips, okay? This is for the place of articulation. And then it is voiceless. Why? Because we don't vibrate the vocal cords. Okay, it is voiceless. And it is also a stop. Because what do you do when you produce the way you produce it, the manner you produce it? What do you do? You block it, stop the air, and then you release it in the form of an explosion. Okay, so stop. The B is different from P in one feature, which is that of voicing. So you see how manner of articulation is important for describing sounds? Okay? So just the vocal cords, you can have P or B. The rest is the same. This is an example. So another example, for instance, is labial dental. Okay? F and V. Labial dental. It, they are both of them labial dental. What do we mean by labial dental? Labial coming from lips and dental coming from teeth. So we use the P lips and we use the teeth together. Okay? And Another feature is that there are both of them fricatives because by opposition to stops, stops we block the air. Okay? But for these fricatives, if you produce them yourselves, you are going to notice that you don't block the air at all. Yes, a little bit. But you, the air keeps going out. You won't, almost you want to block the air, but you don't. Okay? So the air keeps going out. That's why there is a kind of friction between the teeth. You know what we mean by friction? Friction between the teeth, yes, between the teeth and the lips. So they keep like touching each other and the air keeps going out. Yes, please. So that's what we mean by the uh, fricatives. Now, the same feature again, using forced or uh, vocal cords, we can say that F is voiceless because we don't vibrate the vocal cords, voiceless, right? And the R, uh, V is voiced because when we produce V, we, vo we vibrate the vocal cords, okay? Uh, another example is take Th and D, Th and D here, Th and V. Now Th and D, again, they have some common features, they have two common features. The first one is that they are both of them interdental. It means that you use only your teeth, the upper teeth and the lower teeth together. Interdental. That's why they are called interdental. Another feature is that they are both of them fricatives. They are similar to F and V, but they are different in terms of the place of articulation. They are, we don't use the lips here. We just use the upper teeth and the lower teeth together. Then another difference is that F is voiced, voiceless, and V is voiced. F, voiceless, and V is voiced because 
when producing the, we don't vibrate the vocal, okay, the vocal cords, but when we produce the, the, you can do it on your own, and you can notice what time you can do these things in order to feel it more. So the is voiced. Let's go to another example. Uh, let's go to liquids. Okay, we have only one liquid in English, okay, which is L. L, okay, it is a liquid, okay. Let me go to a description here, just to show you what we mean exactly by uh, liquid. Okay, liquid, so. Liquid sounds are found in the overwhelming majority of the world's languages, yes, etc. And English has only one. The term liquid is a non-technical impressionistic expression indicating that the sound what does this mean liquid it means that the sound is smooth and flows easily okay this is the meaning of the feature liquid right it means that the sound is non-technical but it means simply one thing it is smooth the production of that sound is smooth and also, it flows easily. There is no blockage. There is no, uh, and only simple organ parts of okay, the organs of speech are used. Okay, that's the meaning of liquid. Liquids share properties of both consonant and vowels, etc. So, in English, as I said, l is the only one existing in English. It's the only one liquid existing in English. An alveolar liquid. It's alveolar in the articulation of English l. The tongue blade is raised, the tongue blade is raised, and the apex makes contact with the alveolar ridge. The sides of the tongue are lowered, okay, the sides, when you put the top of your tongue, you put it, okay, in the alveolar ridge, of course, the rest is down, okay, of your tongue. So. The sounds of the tongue are lower, permitting the air and sound energy to flow outward. The symbol L represents the so first sound in the word life. Okay, life, for example. L, we have it in life. So, this is what we mean by liquid, right? So, let's go back to the chart again. So, liquids. Another one I would like to stop at uh, is uh, the feature glide. Glide, okay? It's a manner of articulation. Glide and liquid, they both like voice, like voicing. The feature of voicing, it is a manner of articulation, right? And the feature of liquid, it's also a manner of articulation. It refers to the manner, the way we produce a sound. And glide also, it refers to a, a manner, to the way we produce some sounds. The sounds we produce in English, uh, they, are, they are glides. We have the W, okay, W. And R, the okay, R, American, R, usually the American one, R, you know, American, American, okay, and Y, Y, okay. So, what do we mean by glides again? Let me go back to uh, my uh, definitions here from this book. I have glides here. Glides are vowel like articulations. This is what we, one of the main. Uh, aspects of glides. They are almost like vowels. Okay? That's why usually these glides, we refer to them as semi-vowels or as semi-consonants. They are still look like consonants and they look like vowels. It's a mixture of the two. If you do it on your own. It's like, you see, like you say A. You see, it's like a vowel there. Okay? It's like a vowel in there. Okay? So, that's what we mean by Glides. Glides are vowel-like articulations that precede and follow through vowels. The term glide is based on the observation that the sequence of a glide and a vowel is smooth, continuous gesture. Ooh, smooth, continuous gesture. Okay? You are lucky you want to produce a vowel, at the same time you produce a consonant. This normally should be something quite difficult to do. Because vowels are completely different from consonants, you know, okay? The places of producing vowels and the places of producing consonants, these are completely different. And if you want to make something like that, it's something very challenging for the vocal tract to do. But in the case of glides, 
It's not that difficult. It's not a challenge. It's something that is smooth and a continuous gesture. Okay? Because the tongue position, the tongue position, and the articulating in articulating the glides, you and wu, is similar to the tongue position of vowels. Okay? So when you produce yu and when you produce wu, the tongue position is similar to when you want to produce vowels. Okay? For example, in beat, boot, respectively. These glides are sometimes referred to as, as I told you, semi-vowels or semi-consonants. Okay? Some people refer to them as semi-consonants. So those are, that's what we mean by glides. For example, w, it's a bilabial, velarized glide. Okay? Uh, this one, r, r, a malvular glide. American English or okay, it's not really using the tongue, okay, or something more vowel, okay. So an American English or is produced with a tongue blade that is raised toward the alveolar ridge. Many speakers also curl, curl. You know what you mean by curl? Curl the tongue, okay. They curl the apex into a little flexed position, like this, okay? That's why we have something like American. That's why the Americans, they produce the R that way. It's different from the way the British do it. The British, okay? American, usually it's different, okay? But the Americans, it's something quite musical. You can, you can understand that. So, this is, these are examples of glides. So, let me go back again to my chart. Uh, so these are glides, okay? So place of articulation, you can have a bilabial glide, or you can have alveolar glide, like American or, or you can have alveopalatal glide, like y. Yeah, the palate is involved, okay? The alveolar and the palatal region are involved in producing y, yeah, okay? Uh, okay. Glotal. Glotal, you have only one glotal in English, like H, H okay, H. It's glotal because it's produced in the glottis, okay, region. It's also fricative. It's a fricative concerning the manner of articulation. It is a fricative, okay, because the air keeps flowing. You don't block it, okay. You don't block it, okay. And it is voiceless, okay. Voiceless. Good. Let me take an example from here. Okay. Fricatives. We have fricatives. C, Z, Sh, J. And here it is. Okay. A voiceless glottal in fricative. The H sound is often called a glottal fricative because the vocal cords are positioned so that a small amount of turbulent airflow is produced across the glottis okay a small amount of turbulent okay airflow is produced across the glottis however the primary noise source for this speech sound is turbulence created at different points along the vocal tracks where the tongue body uh, it etc so this is a, a description of example for a word in the articulation of the English word heap. It's not he like in Arabic. It's a mixture of both. Okay, he and he. Uh, okay, mixture. So, hip or hesitate or, for example, the tongue body is positioned. Symbol H is used for referring to this sound. Okay? Now, this is what we mean by features so far. Okay? At the beginning, it were, they were introduced in this way. So simple, so easy to remember, okay? Uh, and you have the sounds in here. And please, another thing I wanted to keep, uh, to, to keep in your mind is the symbol used, okay? The symbol used. Most of them, the symbol is not that difficult. But where you have to pay more attention is something like in third, sh and j, ch and j, n and l, l, bring, etc. And this one, the glide, okay, retroflex American R, okay? The rest, the rest, 
the symbol resembles the alphabet. For example, P, it's represented the same way. Right? <laughs> okay? But later on, more features were introduced. Right? Uh, let me go here to page 110. Okay? Focus on vowel, on the consonants so far. Okay? Focus just on consonants. Okay, 110. Yes, here it is. Okay. Distinctive features. Uh, they were introduced, uh, okay, in a book uh, that was uh, proposed by Morris Hell and Noam Chomsky. In 1968, the book is called The Sound Pattern of English. The Sound Pattern of English. So these two linguists, they introduced more features, right? They introduced more features, which we have here, okay? So, some of them, they are the same as we have seen in the previous chart, okay? Using manner of articulation and place of articulation. But there are others which are new, for example, sonorant, okay, uh, strident. These are new features introduced, okay? But before I go into this chart, I want to uh, tell something, is that uh, uh, these two people, uh, they, uh, they used what is called a kind of binary, okay? Binary, okay? Binary system. What do we mean by binary system? As having one of two values. Either a plus value or a minus value. Plus value indicates the presence of the feature. Okay? And the minus value indicates the absence of the feature. For example, let's take the one that you know, which is most popular, voicing. Okay? So some sounds, they have this feature. Okay, so what do we do for them? In order to describe those sounds, we use plus voiced. Okay? Or we say minus voiced. In the beginning, they used to say simply voiced, voiceless. But with the introduction of this book, okay, Halle and Noam Chomsky, a new way has been adopted. Okay? Uh, another thing which is very important for you to remember, uh, which is that the uh, phoneme, okay, the phoneme, we said previously in our lectures that the phoneme is the minimal unit, okay? But with the introduction of this book, that's no more the case, the phoneme. You don't say, for example, P, and then you describe it. This is the minimal unit. Now, with the introduction of this work, this phoneme has been formulated in the form of Okay, features with a binary choice, plus or minus. So instead of telling you, for example, P, okay, in terms of phonology and phonological analysis, they're not going to tell you that the phoneme P is produced sometimes as P and sometimes as B. That's the uh, beginning stage, normal, okay, beginning stage. Later stage, advanced stage, advanced level of uh, using, integrating these features, is that they're going to tell you minus syllabic, but between brackets, of course, they open the brackets, and they're going to, to introduce a number of features in there. They're going to tell you minus syllabic, plus consonantal, minus sonorant, minus voice, minus continuant, etc. All these features, I put them between brackets. This is the phoneme. And this phoneme becomes minus syllabic, plus consonantal, minus sonorant, plus voice, minus, minus, etc. in the context, etc. You understand what I mean? That's the advanced level of doing phonology. So no more the phoneme P or T or K. No, that's, yeah, that's a very preliminary stage. But the later stage, this phoneme has been cut down into a number of distinctive features which used between brackets. So these are the distinctive features that you need to remember. Many of them, of course, are seen in the manner of articulation. 
place of education, but some new ones are introduced, and I'm going to show you what they mean uh, now. For example, let me start with the ones that you have already seen in the previous chart, okay? Which is, of course, voiced, nasal, uh, affricate, labial, round, high, back, low, for vowels, okay? The new ones, yeah, it's not so something really big challenge to understand, as we're going to see, like syllabic, consonantal, sonorant, okay? Voiced, continuant, uh, yes, continuant, okay, etc. Now let me take some of these features, okay? Uh, here you have more sounds, okay? This is a continuation for this list, okay? So you have per, 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 etc. And this is a continuation, says, the, the, etc. Okay? Using the English sounds, with a focus on English sounds. <coughs> and here you have the features for vowels. The features for vowels are the same as we have seen. High, back, low, round. The new ones is this one tense here, and this one syllabic. Syllabic, we're going to see it uh, quickly uh, in, uh, in the following uh, uh, page. Tense simply means long. There are some, 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 some vowels which are long, like sheep, for example, sheep. Okay? By opposition to bad or whatever other sounds. So some, some vowels are long. Why? Because in the way we produce them, the air keeps flowing. Sheep, okay? Eep. Okay? And then short, so tense. You can say minus tense, it means they are not long, they are short. If you say they are plus tense, they are long, like in sheep, okay? Let me go to the features here, like syllabic, okay? Syllabic, it means the feature plus syllabic is assigned to phonemes that can function as the head or peak of a syllable. Okay, you remember last time I've introduced this terminology for describing the syllables. Okay, you remember the chart I presented for you? Syllable divided into peak and a head, etc. So, the feature plus syllabic is assigned to phonemes that can function as the head or peak of a syllable. The vowels of English, by nature, they are all of them plus syllabic. Okay? They are plus syllabic. If you look here, all of the vowels, they are, because they are always put in this position of the syllable. Okay? The peak position. If we go to consonants, yes, minus, minus, minus. Okay? Uh, Yes, here we have syllabic again. You have per, 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 etc. So you have usually the vowel or the syllable starts with a consonant, okay? The syllable, if you take it, it starts with a consonant. And then what comes after a consonant is a vowel. So that's the meaning of syllabic, okay? So consonants are minus syllabic. They don't come in the beginning of the syllable, but they come at uh, the other part of the syllable, okay? The syllable can be divided into two here, okay? It's this part, okay, for you. Now, consonants they are by nature minus syllabic, whereas vowels they are plus syllabic because they are always put in the peak position of uh, syllables. Consonantal phonemes with the feature plus consonantal are formed in the vocal tracts with an obstruction that is at least as narrow as that of a fricative. Note that the glides are therefore not too consonant, nor as we will see are they two vowels. So, consonantal means in their production the vocal tract with an obstruction that is at least as narrow as that of a fricative. There is some kind of obstruction. There is some kind of blockage of the air. Consonantal means there is some blockage of the air. It's not 100% and it's not like what we do in the friction. So in the friction, yes, we keep the, the, the air is growing out, but there is still some, okay, some obstruction, some blockage. An example would be uh, the best to explain this. If we take, for example, se, 
ز ت ذ ش ج اتكسرتوا Now let's go to others like ب ب م ت د ن ك ج So do you see it? The obstruction of the air. Of course, when you produce p, you close your lips. Therefore, you block the air. But when you produce s, no, the air keeps going out. So it's like you are referring to the feature of fricative or the feature of stops. So instead of using stop plus stop minus stop plus fricative minus v, we don't use that. Okay? We use instead of those, we use the feature consonantal. Consonantal plus consonantal, they are the stops. Minus consonantal, they are the fricatives. As simple as that. Is it okay? You remember in the normal features we have introduced in the way of our place of articulation, in the manner of articulation. Let me go back, but it's too many pages to go back. But just to say it again, we have manner of articulation, stop, and we have another manner of articulation which is different, fricative. Now, using this approach, this new approach, we're not going to say like plus stop, plus minus stop, okay? Yes, in the old way of the word, we say it is a stop, we say it is a fricative. But the new approach of distinctive features theory, we use the minus or plus symbol, and the feature that we use for that is, sim is one, consonantal. So if it is a stop, that's what you are going to do. It is plus consonantal. If it is a fricative, you are going to say it is minus consonantal. Okay? So here it is again. So you have, uh, 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 let me uh, say again the example. So you have s. Okay, z, t, d, sh, they are all of them plus because we allow the air to go out. But the stops, they are minus. Okay, where are the stops? Uh, okay. Yes, I, will, uh, I should talk about this one, okay? The r, yes. Uh, I have made a confusion, sorry, for this. I, I was referring to uh, another thing. So, consonantal, we have... Yes, so consonantal, we have... All consonants by nature, they are consonantal. Sorry, I made a confusion. I should correct myself. So, all consonants, they are by nature consonantal. Okay, all uh, consonants, they are by nature plus consonantal. Either the blockage of the air is 100%, okay, or the blockage of the air is not 100%, okay? But for other semi-vowels, the semi-vowels, okay, which, is the, which are the glides, okay, please can you help? Can you help me? Follow with me, okay? So we have the the w, y, okay, all of these sounds here, and h, the h, they are semi-vowels, they are glides, okay? So they are minus consonantal. So that's the the way to put it again. You have the consonants, pure consonants, all of them, they are plus consonantal. But the ones which are semi-vowel, semi-consonants, they are minus consonantal because they are not 100% consonants. Is it okay now? I may, I'm correcting myself. So, all consonants by nature, they are plus consonants, but those which are look like vowels and look like consonants, they are minus consonantal because they are not 100% consonantal. So, this is it again. All vowel, all consonants, so we have plus, 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 all of them, p, b, m, it, etc. And then you have s, z, th, it, etc. All of them, they are true consonants. True consonants, they are consonants, so we refer to them as 
plus consonant of. But the others, which look like vowels, and at the same time they look like consonants, they are minus consonantal. So like uh, the American retroflex are the w, y, and the glottal h. Okay? Is it okay now? Okay, sorry for this confusion I created for you. The other feature is sonorant. Sonorant, what do we mean by sonorant? Sonorant sounds are produced with a vocal tract cavity in which spontaneous voicing is possible. In other words, the vocal tract is not constricted to the extent that airflow across the glottis is inhibited. Vowels, glands, liquids, and nasals are all plus sonorant. Consonants, minus sonorant consonants are frequently referred to as obstruents. So let me go to the chart again and go to the feature of sonorant. So you see here, uh, if you produce l, okay, l, and if you produce a r, w, y, and h, okay, and then by the opposition to, okay, and also m, n, l. I want you just to take these. Maybe these are the best way to uh, uh, explain what we mean by sonorant. Sonorant, it like refers to the musicality in the production of the sound. So when you produce, for example, p, t, k, g, etc., and then try to pronounce m, n, okay? There is some extra feature in there, musical feature, let's call it that way, between quotes, which makes these different from the other non-musical, in other words, let me call it that way, between quotes, Sounds okay, so m, n, l, it together with uh, l, r, w, y, uh, they are all of them, all of them they include that huge feature of musicality between quotes, but the others don't like p, t, k, it, etc. So these are the plus sonorant sounds, and the others are minus. So now, let me go now to the feature of continuance. Ah, yes, yes, here it is. So continuant sounds are made with a complete blockage of the oral cavity. Plus continuant sounds are made without such a blockage. By this definition, nasals are oral, minus continuant stops. Although airflow and acoustic energy are shunted through the nasal cavity. Example again. If you have a look, let's go to the first part of the uh, chart. So we have continuant feature here. We have F, it's continuant. V, S, Z, F, V, Sh, J. Le, re. Now, how? What is the feature in the old model? The old model. There is a feature that describes or explains the feature of continuant, plus continuant, and minus continuant. Now, what is common between all these sounds using the old terminology? Manner of articulation. Yes, somebody said that. Fricatives. So fricatives, s, z, t, d. So all of them they are fricatives. Using the new terminology, what are we going to say? They are plus continuant. But the others which are stops, they are minus continuant. Okay? It likes it refers to the uh, airflow. The airflow in the production of fricatives is continuant, okay? It goes on, out. But for the stops, it is blocked. So, 
plus continuant, it means the air is still going out. Fricatives, plus continuant. But for the sounds where the air is blocked, stops, it is minus continuant. It's okay? Let me, it's uh, so simple, okay? So we have fricatives, okay? What do we do in fricatives? Where the air keeps going out, okay? So they are plus continuant. But for the others where the air is blocked 100%, and then there is an explosion, they are minus continuant. Instead of saying to me in your analysis that we have a fricative, you should use okay the new terminology. You should say plus continuant. And for per, ter, ket, etc., you are going to say instead of saying plus stop or stop, you say it is a minus continuant. Okay? Student. Okay, students. So, uh, maybe to explain this, I focus on one example related to s, s, z. Okay? If you notice, in the production of these sounds, in addition to the fact that the air keeps going out, okay, there is some extra sound in there, which is like s. Okay, an extra sound that you produce, and that's what we mean by student. Student sounds are characterized by the high frequency turbulent noise that accompanies the production of some fricatives. Some fricatives you have that turbulent noise, there is a turbulent noise in there, but th, can you pronounce th? There is no turbulent noise. Th, no turbulent noise, but s, sh, z. Okay, there is a turbulent noise that accompanies the production of that sound. So that's what we mean by plus student minus student. If that turbulent noise that you have exactly when producing s and sh, okay, we call them plus student. But if you don't have you say minus student. Let's go back to the chart again. Now the plus student, you have th, th. There is that turbulent noise. But then, okay, s, z, and then sh, z, ch, j. Okay? But then for th and th, so th and th, there are also fricatives. Because this turbulent noise exist only with fricatives, but not all fricatives. Some of, most of the fricatives, yes, they are plus student. There is that turbulent noise accompanying the airflow. But for other sounds, there is no turbulent noise, like in s, sh, etc., as we have in t and th. There is no turbulent noise, so they are minus student. So you see the importance of including this feature that's the importance of including so many features. Because the value of a feature is it helps you differentiate between sounds. Yes, stops, it's good. Fricatives, they are good. But they are not enough. So linguists, when they were analyzing data and languages, they felt that we need to include more features to, in, to differentiate between sounds. Because they found that fricatives, yes, fricatives, but still within fricatives, you can have voice, voiceless, that's a good thing. But again, there is something else that we should rely on to differentiate between some types of fricatives. Like when we produce s, sh, j, and then when we produce th, th. These are, there is some difference in that. So we need a feature, a new feature that we have to introduce, and that feature is referred to in here as strident. It refers to that kind of turbulent noise that we produce with some fricatives, but not with others. So some fricatives are plus, strident, others are not. So you see why we have these distinctive features? That's the importance of having them. They help us, they help linguists to differentiate between sounds. Okay? Now, the other feature again. 
lateral so lateral is similar to the feature of liquid but <coughs> using the new terminology using in the new framework of the wave phonological analysis introduced by Ali and Chomsky uh, they don't they no more use the feature of liquid they're not going to tell you L is plus liquid or minus or P is minus liquid D is minus liquid whereas L is no they have introduced a new feature it's the same as liquid it has the same meaning but it's different a little bit different instead of saying liquid they say lateral okay lateral so that's and if you go to the chart, you're, you're going, sorry, you're going to notice that the only feature which is, or the only sound which is lateral, look here, that uh, all of them, they are minus lateral, okay, the other part, all of them are minus lateral, the only one that is lateral is L, plus lateral, okay? Distributed, Again, so distributed, you have sh, j, ch, and j, okay? Distributed. The term distributed refers to the relative length of contact that the tongue makes along, not across the roof of the mouth okay it refers to the relative length of contact you have the contact a contact going on in your mouth between two organs but then some contact can be long other can be short so the feature of distributed refers to the length of the contact between okay these organs of your okay uh, speech organs now the relative length of contact that the tongue makes along, not across the roof of the mouth. The tongue has a relatively longer region of contact along the roof of the mouth in articulating shh, shh. There is a longer contact than it articulating s. Okay? Shh. The tongue, okay, touches the higher level of your vocal tract and the contact is longer sh whereas for s yes the tongue goes up and touches contacts but the contact is not long sh okay sh is plus distributed and s is minus distributed okay other examples of plus are we have them here. There are four of them in here. Sh, j, ch, and j. Okay. Sh, j, ch. And now, at home, you can try that as many times as possible to feel it. Okay. So, distributed refers to the length of contact between your tongue, especially in this case, the tongue and the palate, the half palate or the alveolar ridge part. So if it is long, the contact is long, then it is plus distributed. So you have to remember that the plus distributed sounds in English are sh, j, ch, and j. The minus distributed are the others. Okay? Because those are the only ones. If you go here, Again, distributed, so all of them, they are minus, okay? Now, what else we have? Affricates. Affricates. We have only two affricates, okay? Which are, okay, ch and j. What do we mean by affricates again? Delayed release, okay? Affricates. It refers to delayed release. Pa. Sh, okay. Pa, b, all of them. You have a release that is uh, immediate. Okay. But then for sh, there is a delayed release of the air. 
you block it and you keep blocking it for some time of course and then you release it the release is delayed not like in stops it's etc delayed release delayed release of what? of the air so the only two we have are which are plus okay uh, affricates are ch and j okay because why be simply because they include two types of sound they include the stop and they include the fricative t and sh sh and j okay so delayed release so that's affricates <laughs> then the others are similar to what we have seen before labial 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 sounds it means the ones where we use the lips okay labial so the ones where we don't use the labels they are minus labial for example s z etc they are minus labial we don't use the lips okay this is similar to the old terminology it is adopted within the new framework okay so you can say plus or minus labial round round referring to rounding of the mouth so some sounds okay they are plus round others are minus round for example w the best example here is w there is round in there so this is plus round but the others most of the other consonants they are minus round okay coronal <coughs> Okay, coronal, maybe we need to explain that. Okay, let's go to... Uh, so, coronal, in articulating a coronal phoneme, the blade of the tongue is raised toward or touches the teeth. So, the blade of the tongue is raised and what happens it touches the teeth or it touches the alveolar ridge or an area along the back of the alveolar ridge dental alveolar and alveopalatal consonants are coronal okay for leaves so the blade of the tongue is raised and touches the teeth the alveolar right ridge and all the area back to the alveolar ridge so for example dentals alveolars so you remember dentals right what are they right dentals can you give me an example dental <laughs> th, th, th. okay okay so for example al alveolar okay so alveopalatal so all of these they are plus coronal so let me go to here so, s, z, the, uh, the blade of the tongue. The blade of the tongue goes or raises. Right? And then it touches the alveolar ridge or it touches the teeth or the back area of the alveolar ridge. Okay? So, that's a coronal. So, s, z, f, v, it, etc. All of them are plus coronal, but... Can you pronounce w? W. Your your tongue is not involved. It doesn't touch the alveolar area. It doesn't touch the teeth. So therefore, it is minus coronal. Another example that is minus p, b, etc. But for th, v, okay, the r plus coronal, l, coronal, okay. So whenever you have your blade of the tongue that goes up and touches the area immediately back of your teeth, which is called the alveolar, so it they are plus coronal. But if you have other areas of your mouth, like the back or like the velar, etc., that is involved, so they are minus, okay, coronal. Is it okay? In the new framework, again, just to explain further, within this new framework, they are not going to say, to describe the sounds like s, z, 
it etc they are not going to tell that they are alveolars no they are going to say they are plus colonal okay it's simply a new way of describing sounds and this new way is more precise and more pertinent okay so alveolars we are not going to say they are plus alveolar and others are minus alveolar. No, that's the old way of doing it. So you say alveolar or another one. But the new approach, it tells that we can use the feature of corolla, okay? And you can say that they are minus or plus, okay? <coughs> Sorry for this because I had a cold. Interior, okay? Interior. Now let's move on to the description again. Anterior. Sounds are made with the primary constriction in front of the alveopalatal position. Labial, dental, interdental, alveolar articulations are so the labials, all of them, the dentals, all of them, the interdentals, all of them, the alveolars, all of them, they are plus anterior. Okay? Here again you have C, Z, etc. And then L and the American retroflex R. It's plus anterior. The others are minus anterior. Then for P, B, etc., they are plus and the others are minus. High, back, and low. So all these are features, okay? You can refer to them. And I'm going to post in the blog some descriptions like this. I post them for you so that you keep them with you. Uh, because I need to go to exercises, okay? We need to go to exercises to show you the kind of thing we you are expected to do 